please open your Bibles this evening to Hebrews in chapter 6. We're looking toward the end of the chapter. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6. If I were to preach this entire portion of the text that uh, has the flow of thought in context, I probably would preach the longest sermon of my life, and that would be saying something. And uh, I think it's really a great time. The irony of it just strikes me to preach the longest sermon ever when there's a smell of food in the room. Amen. <laughs> Go for it. It's just cruelty compounded. I want to look at verse 16. I, I, I'll try not to do that this evening. I've actually been praying and I won't do that this evening. I want to, I'm asking God to, uh, we'll ask again here in a minute, to help me to be succinct this evening and uh, try to just be able to highlight a few of the things. But I'll tell you what, this book, this portion of this book is loaded. So look at verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 6. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Notice verse 19 was saying about this this evening. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, wherein the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Father, please help us this evening to be succinct. Help us not to be uh, too long drawn out. On the other hand, God, help us to be able to really grasp some matters that have to do with your character. And I pray that we be impressed by who you are and by what you are capable of performing. And more than that, God, by what has been already done in the work of the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of a passage of Scripture that is in a long flow of a context. The entire flow of the context of the letter to the Hebrews is that this is a letter which is written to believers who are also Jewish, who are Hebrew Christians, who are going back from following the Lord Jesus. This week, I've had a couple of individuals that I've never met before contact me on the phone and they've been concerned about the matter of their salvation. And one of the reasons uh, for that is that they are, have gone back. They have not lived for Jesus the way that they ought to. And so they're concerned with some things, and oftentimes because of false doctrine, because of bad preaching or bad teaching, they've been affected by it. But those uh, many individuals are struggling with going back from following Jesus. I wonder if I've done my best for Jesus. That's a kind of scary song, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, it talks about wasted time, wasted opportunity. And man, I'll tell you, when I, I, I try not to wonder too much about that. I try to wonder enough to keep me honest about the present and the future. I want to live for Jesus now, but if I look back, I'll be nothing but discouraged at how much time I've wasted and how many folks that maybe I could have helped to save that I have not. And so, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but the reality of it, believer, is that Christians struggle with hardship in their life, in their faith. It's a lie that a believer never goes through anything that will cause him to learn, learn endurance. You know, James really gives us a perspective about the same, doesn't he? He tells us that the trying of our faith worketh patience. And friend, that flies in the face of the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel does not believe in the trying of faith. Uh, the prosperity gospel believers rebuke the trying of faith. And they rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Oftentimes, you ever since try to give a reality check to somebody and they say, I rebuke that? I rebuke that? What are they rebuking? Well, I think sometimes it, it's just a silly notion that what, what they're trying to rebuke, but the, what they're trying to say is, I will not learn patience. 
I will not go through difficulty. I will not go through hardship. Uh, I will not have to endure something. Friend, everything that you endure is from God. Everything that you endure, God wants in your life to teach you patience and grow you closer to Him. But the Hebrew Christians are going through probably more than anybody here ever has. Take your mind off of yourself for a little bit and put your thoughts, align your thoughts on these individuals who have lost everything. Have lost everything. Uh, you say, Pastor, uh, you know, I've lost a lot of friends. These individuals lost their family. Lost their family, the people they grew up with. And it wasn't as though they didn't like their family or their family didn't like them. You know, some folks have, honestly, they've grown up in such dysfunctional situations that sometimes the reality of it is is that you can't really have a good relationship with your family. That's the reality. It's tragic, but it's sometimes true, isn't it? You know, you can't have a relationship with that brother or sister. You just can't. Why? Well, because of what they do. Until that person changes, you can't have a relationship with them. That's the way it is. We're talking about good family. We're talking about your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, the people that you're closest with. And because you've become a believer in Jesus, you've been now become estranged from them. And if they don't estrange themselves from you, their lives would literally uh, just be a shambles because of what would happen to them by the religious leaders and by their neighbors and by other business people. So, then there's the whole issue of being Jewish and having Rome about to destroy Jerusalem. You're about to lose everything anyway that way. <coughs> So some believers have just said it's too tough to live for Jesus. Too tough to live for Jesus. There are examples of this before this letter to the Hebrews. You ever read just in the Gospels when we see who Jesus is, and you see a phrase oftentimes, particularly for instance in Matthew, many believed. Many believed. After Jesus did a miracle, many believed. And then it says others believed not. And then it says some believed, but secretly, not openly. Why? For fear of the Jews. And so, I have a hard time seeing the difference between a secret believer, one who believes but will not align himself with the believers, will not fellowship with the believers or get to be part of the fellowship of the believers, and someone who has become part of the fellowship and then has gone away from it. What's the difference? There isn't any difference, is there? So it's not something new, but it's something that needs to be dealt with. And Christian, can I urge you, don't go back from following Jesus. Don't go back from following Jesus. And you know, don't make little of what you have in Jesus Christ. And that's really what the letter to the Hebrews has done. Two ways, remember? Two ways the letter of Hebrews gives us reasons not to go back. One is, by here's a good reason why Jesus is better. Why it's better to be in the fellowship with Christ and with believers than it is to go back into Judaism. It's better because Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. And Jesus is not only better than Moses, but He's better than the Levites. That's where we're in our passage of Scripture now. So, Jesus is better. So, good reasons to follow Jesus. He's better than what you'd go back to. And then, of course, there are the warnings. And just like Jude says, and if some have compassion, making a difference, and it says, others save with fear. Yeah. And so the second way that the Holy Spirit uses to urge us not to stop following Jesus is to scare us to not follow Jesus. I thought my dad would wake up. There he goes. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> is to scare us into, not, into uh, following Jesus. You know, whatever works for you. You know, anyone who's raised kids knows you have some kids that talking to really helps. And then you have some kids that talking to really doesn't help. And so you've got to put the fear in them. And so we're like that as believers as well sometimes, aren't we? Sometimes, man, just seeing the love of God and knowing God's goodness and who Jesus is, I want to live for Him. That's a good reason. It's good motivation. And sometimes just because I'm terrified to death. But either way, it's good motivation, isn't it? So here we are in tonight's passage of Scripture. You may say, Pastor, why are we at the end of chapter 6? when the beginning of chapter 6 is perhaps one of the most hotly debated uh, passages in the Scripture that a lot of people are confused about. Some people teach that it is teaching that you can lose your salvation and so forth on 
and other people teach Calvinism from this passage of Scripture. Why are you passing over that passage of Scripture? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I'm scared to preach it. I just don't know what it means. And so I'm just not going to go there. No, it's because it, it doesn't fit within the context of what we're preaching here this evening. We'll go back there. But last week, we were introduced to Melchizedek. I really want to focus on Melchizedek this evening and Jesus Christ being better than Melchizedek. <coughs> you know, every time I come to Hebrews, I think, you know what, I want to just go back to the Old Testament of the Scripture and learn everything I can about Melchizedek. You know what I learn every time I decide I'm going to do that? Not very much. Not very much, because there isn't very much in the Old Testament about Melchizedek. And so, Melchizedek is really a mysterious individual, isn't he? And this... This priest that Abraham offered a sacrifice to is really a mysterious individual. And uh, we're told in Hebrews chapter 5 that because the believers have gone back and because it, for a time they've been saved long enough that had they been in the fellowship and had they been growing the way that they should have been, they ought to be teaching other people. But they don't even have the basics down themselves and so they have need that others teach them. They have to be fed with milk and not with meat. And they're urged in chapter 6 and verse 1 to leave the principles of the first things, the doctrine of Christ, of repentance from sins and of baptism. And talks about all these basic things that believers ought to just be settled about and move past. Man, because they've gone back into Judaism and they're confused by false theology, they're confused by their bad behavior, they don't have assurance of their salvation. And they, they don't know for sure about Bible doctrines. And they, they ought to, that ought to have been something they learned a long time ago and they've known for years. But it isn't. But we're, they're told, well, we can't really explain something that has some depth to you because you're a baby. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think you are. I don't think that, I don't think that you fit in the criterion of a person who needs to be fed with milk and not with meat. We need to be careful about throwing that phrase around just a little bit too, don't we? Sometimes it's just a term of derision. Or sometimes it's a way of kind of putting someone down if they don't agree with us. And so we oh, yeah, have to be fed with milk. Uh, can't understand the deep things of God. Well, the reality of it is, is that the people who fall into that classification are believers who have stopped going to church. It's not you is it? So, the, the, the analogy kind of breaks apart at that level, at that stage. We're talking about folks that have, they, they, they really have wavered in their faith and they have gone so far away from fellowship with God, they don't know what they know. And they're, they're uncertain even about their salvation, which the Bible says will happen when we're not in fellowship with the Lord. And so, Melchizedek is brought into the matter and Psalm 110. Let's go there because that's where we get, where we get our context. And I want to look at a word in Psalm 110 that ought to impress us a bit. If you can't get there quickly enough, I'm going to start reading. It's verse 4. The whole chapter is only seven verses, uh, but it's all, about, it's all prophetic about Jesus. The Bible says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, sometimes words are just that. You know, we sing the song, we have an anchor that keeps our soul steadfast and sure. But you know, an anchor that keeps our soul is kind of a big deal, isn't it? Something that anchors your soul? Sometimes we think, well, a hymn writer came up with that. No, a hymn writer read that in Hebrews. And this is a doctrinal <coughs> truth that's a soul anchor. It's one of those things that just gets you anchored, gets you settled, gets you strong, gets you steadfast and sure about the hope which is eternal life. And this evening, we are in the middle of that context where Melchizedek is referenced, and we see that the Lord swore, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we don't think much about the, you know, the oath part of it, but the author of Hebrews makes a big deal out of the fact that God swore thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So let's look at that this evening, shall we? Verse 16, 
the context, if you're reading chapter 6, is about Abraham and God's promise or His oath with Abraham and His promise of blessing him. And we see in verse 16, for men verily, that means truly, swear by the greater. An oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Swear on your mother's grave. Or when a person says, I swear, they're saying they swear by something. I swear by all that is holy and true. Well, the question is, when God is going to confirm something with an oath, and He's going to make a, uh, a He's going to make an oath that has an effect, that if it were not true, there would be an effect to the person. Swear on your own life, for instance. If God's going to swear by something, well, when a man swears by something, he swears, don't take this the wrong way, he swears to God. Understand what that means when somebody says that? They're swearing by something greater than themselves. And God says, don't do that. But if God is going to, to make an immutable oath, who's He going to swear by? So. Honest Abe? I swear by Abraham Lincoln. Now he swears by himself. And that's a help because God cannot lie. God does not comprehend a lie. Teens, remember in uh, Teen Sunday School a couple weeks ago, we're in Ecclesiastes 5, and we're talking about the reason why you don't make vows. You don't make vows that you're not going to keep because God can't lie. And when you make a promise to God, God doesn't understand when you say, well, it was a, it was a mistake. It was a lie. When God makes a promise, God keeps His Word, and that's what He understands from you and I. That you'll keep our your word, we'll keep our word. Okay, so now, in verse 17, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability. You guys know what that immutability word means? What's something that's immutable? Can never change. Okay, can never can never change. I said can't never. That is a contradiction, isn't it? It can never change. <clears throat> now what's immutable? It's unbreakable. It's unbreakable. It's a contract that there's not a loophole in. And so the Bible says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. What are those things? Well, the immutability of His counsel confirmed by an oath. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. <clears throat> When my father and mother forsake me, the Lord. Remember this? Say it with me. When my father and mother forsake me, the Lord. Well, what? Y'all are so quiet. Take me up? It's lift me up, isn't it? The Lord will lift me up. Yeah. You may be betrayed by the closest of relationships, but God will never betray you. You may be disappointed by promises that people make, but God will never disappoint you. He'll always keep His word and His promise. And the Bible says it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hope upon the, or lay hold upon the hope set before us. What's the hope set before us? Salvation. You know the definition of hope in the Scripture. Hope is not possibility. Hope is future uh, certainty. Hope is not possibility. Hope is future certainty. I hope I get a brownie tonight. <coughs> Alright? Well, I'm not dismissing y'all until I'm going to have Charlie come up and pray. And I'm going to go back there and put my hands on the brownies while he's praying. And then I'll have hope for having a brownie this evening. Not really. I'm not really going to do that this evening. But the fact is, is that there are things that may that may circumvent my having a brownie this evening. But there's nothing that's going to stop me from having eternal life because it's based on the immutability of the promise of God. Amen. And the Bible says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast 
and which entereth into that within the veil. What's the veil? The veil of the temple. The veil of the temple or the veil. The veil of His flesh. That is what gives us the ability to go into the Holy of Holies, the holy place. You and I are able to go right through the veil. We know what happened to the veil of the temple is rent from the top to the bottom, ripped open, giving access to God. We have that hope. Friend, whatever you're fleeing from, you can flee to. You can flee to God. Now, friend, the tragedy of it is that people who don't have that hope, what are they fleeing from? They're fleeing from God. Isn't it a wonderful reversal because of the mutability of God that instead of fleeing from God, we're fleeing to God? We cry to Jesus. We cry to God. We go to God. And my friend, He'll always be there. You may have people that would like to be there and sometimes they cannot. Isn't it so? You ever wanted to be there for someone, but you could not? I think that'd be true of all of us, wouldn't it? God is never in that situation. And yet, a person who goes into Judaism, what are they afraid of? Well, they're afraid of God. They're afraid of Jesus. If you go away from following Jesus, you go back from following the Lord Jesus, my friend, you're fleeing God instead of to God. You're fleeing from God instead of to God. Lost people. Lost people. What's their fear? Well, they're afraid of death. Why are people really afraid of, of death? They're afraid of judgment. Why are people afraid of judgment? What? Because they're guilty. But what makes them afraid? What? Punishment. And who's going to punish them? God. They're afraid of God. People are afraid of God. Unless you know Him. Unless you know Jesus. <coughs> Friend, this is one of those truths that anchors our soul. When God made His promise to Abraham, remember Abraham was put into a deep sleep and God passed through the divided bullock Himself? Because Abraham couldn't keep His promise to God, but God could keep His promise to Abraham. And God can keep His promise to you. And so you want to go into Judaism? You want to go away from following Jesus? You want to go into the world? Want to go back to something that you came from or that you were delivered from? There's no hope there. There's no help there, is there? It's only hope in Jesus. A couple more things this evening. We mentioned, of course, Melchizedek. I just want to read some things about Melchizedek in verse, verse 1 of chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, preached to the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness. That's what the meaning of Melchizedek is. And after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. This is why people believe that Melchizedek would have been a, an Old Testament appearing of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's all we know about Him. There certainly is more here than any person can know for certain. Verse 4, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoil. Notice the first two words of verse 4. What are they? Now consider. And so the idea here is think on that. Think on this. Meditate on this. Think how great Melchizedek must have been if Abraham gave a tenth of his spoil. So then the Holy Spirit, the author of Hebrews, explains that. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, 
though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So the Levites have the right to take tithes from the other 11 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> if they have the right to take tithes, they have a special office. They have a special calling, don't they? That is, literally, the other tribes are subordinate in a way or subservient to them because they pay them tithes. Now, verse 6, But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Now, this is not saying that Abraham was better and so Melchizedek was blessed by him. No, we're talking about Melchizedek's blessing for Abraham. The Bible says this is there's without any contradiction. That is, there's no exception to this. The fact is, is that the better blesses the less. And so Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And if that's true, and it is, in verse 8, Here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And I love this permission that the Holy Spirit gives us this author. And as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. And here's the whammy. If Levi is a descendant of Abraham, then he was in the loins of Abraham. So when Abraham <laughs> paid tithes to Melchizedek, so did Levi. Mm -hmm. Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. And of course, we know where this is going to go already, don't we? Then. If you're going to go back into Judaism, you're going to go back into a priesthood. You're going to go back and be under. You're going to be the less for the better. You're going to be striving to be blessed by someone greater than who you are, the Levites. But it's still not as good as Melchizedek was to Abraham. This whole idea of second best. Second best. You know, there are some things in life it's okay to settle for less than the best in, right? I'm trying to think what they are. Um, you don't want to try that with your spouse. Uh, you don't want to try it with your church. You know, well, you know, the best church is over there, but I go to second best Baptist church. You don't want to try it with most things, but there are some things, right? I mean, it's a reality. People drive Fords. <laughs> uh, so you know what I'm saying there, there can be an economy where uh, where you know there's a reason why the best is not always the thing that's called for Here, here's an example every time I look at these benches up here they irritate me do these benches <laughs> irritate you you ever notice that the grain of the wood right here on the corners See the grain of the wood on the, the reinforcement, how it goes up and down? But the grain of the wood goes this way on the, on the bench. That is just wrong. Right? Does that bug anybody? Every time I look at these benches, I see that. It stands out to me. And um, then they, they've never been sanded and sealed and, and tightened up the way they should have been. But you know, we had a deadline making these benches. And I had to just throw them together one one day we had uh, we had we were having revival services and we wanted to have a place where people could kneel and so we made them and we had time constraints and we just couldn't do the best job and it was better to have second best benches than the best ones so there's an example where a B grade or C grade furniture could suit the purpose just fine they're plenty strong they work fine for writing on for the kids with markers and they work fine for jumping up and down on and use it for a platform around here, but they drive me nuts. The construction of them really just drives me bonkers. They're not finished, and they're wrong. Anyway, so now you see a little bit in the way that I think when I look around at things. Uh, <laughs> but they serve the purpose, don't they? In other words, they're taking up space, and that's what we needed, something to take up space. <laughs> All right. But friend, I'm going to tell you something. When it comes to your priest, when it comes to the person you pay tithes to, when it comes to your God. Well, He's not quite as good as the Supreme Almighty God, but 
It'll do. It'll serve. And that literally is what happens when you go back into Judaism. You've got a religion that's really just garbage, but serves the purpose of the person who goes back into it. And the purposes have been listed out. Purpose is you're, 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 you're struggling, you're having a hard time in your faith, and you're in, immature, and you don't want to go forward, and you don't want to have a struggle, and so this religion works for you. And isn't it true that for a vast majority of the world, their religion works for them? May not be the best, may not be God, but it's pretty good. And the Holy Spirit here is trouncing the notion that a second best priest is any good at all. Second best priest can't give you the hope that anchors your soul. A second best priest cannot give you a promise that's steadfast and sure and immutable based on his own character. He's got to swear by someone else. And so in the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at Jesus Christ, our high priest, and how that he's better than any other kind of priest that you could have. And I think it's rather polite of the Holy Spirit to even acknowledge any other priest. Don't you? Because the truth of the matter is that Jesus is the only, the only true priest that can stand between us and God. <coughs> Father, help us to just hold to this truth. And hold to it on the basis of your character. A God who is immutable that cannot lie and help it to anchor our, our soul. So be steadfast and sure. God, I pray for our fellowship this evening that follows. So that we would be reminded of the benefit. God, there would be people here that perhaps have been forsaken by friends and family because of Jesus Christ, because of following Jesus. And yet, Father, here they are with the fellowship of the, of the brethren that they're not forsaking. And so they are recipients. They are being beneficiaries of Your promise. And I pray that we'd enjoy our fellowship tonight. With that in mind, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're really privileged tonight, of course, to have uh, Alex and Emily and Oscar with us. Yeah, they're just some of the best people in the world.